Hi, welcome again to another edition of Rural Review Cinematic Underground with Chuck and Chike. We're back again discussing this week's movies. <laughs> Chuck, how was your week so far? Very busy, but good. I, I like this time of year because you're starting to see things turn at the movies. We're trying to finally getting some good stuff coming in. So it's, uh, and of course, that ramps up to the end of the year with the award stuff. So uh, I'm encouraged. Okay. Uh, you had an interview a couple weeks ago, or maybe this week, with uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Ryan Johnson? Yes, yeah, you uh, can see that interview on my uh, YouTube page, C. Kaplinsky. Uh, very interesting interview, and uh, those two guys, very smart, uh, very jovial, uh, I would say jovial, although they were quite tired because they had just gotten back from the Toronto International Film Festival. Wow. Uh, but yeah, and uh, it was obvious that they were very enthused and proud of, of Looper. As they should be. Okay, I was going to say, should they be that proud? I don't know. You've seen the movie. I've seen the movie. Come uh, on, nitpicker. Pick it to death. Uh, all right. So I have a thing with time travel movies. They're causality for how things happen and, and the effect of sometimes what traveling through time can do. Mm -hmm. And time travel movies can be very messy. D directors could have all the best intentions for having a character travel in time, but there are often problems with it. And I can't cite a specific example at the moment. I would want to say Back to the Future has those issues. But, y you know, the Robert Zemeckis found ways out of that repeatedly. Um, for me, Looper is one of those <laughs> films that really just gets all the rules right. If you give us a good set of rules and you follow those rules to a T, then you're going to have a very polished, well-crafted movie. Now, this is in part due... The, the film's greatness, or goodness, is in part due to Joseph Gordon-Levitt being cast as Joe, uh, and his willingness to kind of put on prosthetics to become a younger version of Bruce Willis. And I have to say that watching Joe interact with Bruce is kind of looking at the mirror image of Bruce Willis. Even though I know what he looked like in his earlier days because he was on Moonlighting, I really believe that the two complement each other well, and I believe all the science fiction trappings of time travel work to great effect for what Ryan Johnson uses as his rule. <coughs> what did you think, Chuck? I thought it was, yeah, you're, you're right, exactly, as far as time travel movies sometimes trip up on their own logic or leave too many loose ends. And, uh, I think they were very conscious of that. Uh, as Johnson, I know, wrote the script as well as directed, I think he was quite conscious of that. And while I don't think every single uh, strand is tied up neatly, enough of them are. Yeah. A a and you appreciate that. I, you know, <coughs> I, I appreciate sh smart science fiction, as I know you do, too. Mm -hmm. And this one I liked because the time travel thing wasn't just a gimmick. Correct. I mean, so much of the story revolves around it, but also so much of this character's intentions. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of existential stuff here. Uh, I mean, I, and it boggles the mind what a great idea to be able to sit down and talk to yourself 30 years in the past or future, however it may be. I mean, that's, I mean, what, what wouldn't you give to be able to do that? Yeah. And to see that played out on screen, I thought was, was really interesting. I was really shocked <coughs> by the fact that there were a lot of small human moments in the film. Well, you know, and that's what separates it from, yeah. you know, usual science fiction. Usual you know. popcorn junk. Yeah, this isn't Time Cop, you know. Yeah. You know, although I did like Time Cop. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is more about the impact of decisions that we make. Right. And how we don't see the long-term ramifications of the, um, of the decisions we make. Mm -hmm. But, of course, in this film, you know, you do see that and, you're, and the characters have the luxury or the curse of saying, oh, my God, I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I like the little <coughs> kid in this film. Little kid is good. He's creepy too. <laughs> little kid is Kid's creepy. really, <laughs> really creepy. I also, I also like Paul Dano. Uh, yeah. As one of the agents, and I believe they got the guy from Terminator: The Sarah Connor Chronicles at one point. The guy who's in the house. I've never seen that movie, uh, that show. I don't know, but also Jeff Daniels pops up. Yeah, and here's very a, atypical part for him, which I like. Here's the thing I like about Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels really makes these interesting acting choices in terms of the roles he takes on. I was happy to see him reunited with Joseph Gordon-Levitt because the last time I saw those two together was in the film, The Lockout. Mm -hmm. or was it lo no, The Lookout, I'm Lookout. sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really liked their chemistry together and it shows again here uh, for the brief amount of scenes that they have together. Um, I, however, the, the, the 
weakness of the film I thought was Emily Blunt. Even though she pulled off a very good American accent, I really didn't feel for her character at all. I really didn't, I wasn't emotionally drawn or tethered to her throughout the film. She was my weak point in the film. Well, she's my weak point too, but for other reasons. Okay. <laughs> um, I also think that the romantic uh, subplot with uh, Joe and her character Sarah was muddled and unneeded f for the film. Um, but I think people who go see this film, the shining example of why this film works is going to be the scene <coughs> in the diner. Yeah, yeah, where they, <coughs> the two Joes are talking. Yeah, where they have that conversation. Yeah. Well, that's uh, what I mean. That's, that's the whole deal. Or maybe, or maybe for them it will be the lead up to the diner because there is that one time travel conceit that is used just before we go to the diner scene mm -hmm. that will get people involved or engrossed in what happens. I always thought in the quiet moments of this film that somebody was going to get shot in the head. Yeah, it, uh, it puts you on that edge. Yeah. Yeah, because there is that notion that anything can happen. Anything can happen. Yeah. And so I was really, I was really on my tiptoes. I also want to give a slight bit of mention to a character who was really used for only like two minutes in the entire film. Piper Perabo's character was interesting to me. I didn't really have any sentiment towards her, but I didn't dislike her either. It was almost like she was the mother figure that Joe's character didn't get. Mm -hmm. And I, I liked her nurturing nature. And I didn't know that there was something behind it until later in the film. I was oh, like, yeah. oh, that makes sense then. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, also, I find her mildly attractive. If you took away Just mildly. Most, if you took away the, most of the makeup, it would, it would be better, okay. I think. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll write her an email to yeah, that. Yeah, we'll write her an email to that effect. <coughs> uh, I have a friend who knows her because he works on her show, Covert Affairs. So I'll make sure to pass the message Didn't along. Didn't realize she had a show. Okay. Yeah, she does. Um, overall, I really, really enjoyed this film. If I had to rate it, I would give it mm, four and a half out of five. Mm, okay. I, I don't think it was perfect. There's still that one piece that you and I discussed before the show. Right. That I think dragged it a bit. Well, that's fine, but also it's a movie that begs for a multiple viewings. Yeah. And I'm sh maybe when I see it again, Maybe that will clear itself up. We'll have to wait and see. I do have one last question about the film, though. W was there a point where, did you see any of it coming? No. See, I didn't either. No, and, that, other, and, that's, a, and that's a big plus. Other, other than one tiny thing was a giveaway for me that, oh, well, maybe this could mean this. Um, and I'm referring to the little kid and uh, Joe and what their relationship may, pop, or what he may be. Right. in the future to Joe. Uh -huh. I, I, I did see that coming only because of what happened when the kid got angry at his mother. I said, okay, this is clearly th the goal of the movie. This kid is clearly the goal. Uh -huh. uh, and I hope that doesn't give too much weight of viewers. Do you think it does? No. Okay. Uh, but I did see that bit. But beyond that, nothing else was really telegraphed, and mm -hmm. that's why I enjoyed the film so much. Yeah. So uh, there was another film that I saw yeah, right, a week or two ago. Right, and then there's another one I want to talk about briefly, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's another film that I saw a week or two ago, and you were actually in my theater. Um, and they own the theater. Yeah. Okay. So um, we saw The Master together, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Uh, can you describe this film for our viewers? Because I'm going to have a lot of trouble with it. Well, um, you know, the good movies are the ones that keep you thinking. Um, so many movies you see, and if I didn't have to write a review of them, uh, I would probably forget about them five minutes after I leave the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, the Master, obviously, is certainly not one of those films. It's something I've been thinking about on and off uh, since we saw it. And I think I may have a theory as to what it's about and what the structure is. Okay, please, because uh, I, I, I need the help. All right. Uh, basically, the film focuses on a character played by Joaquin Phoenix, uh, who is very damaged. He's damaged psychologically uh, and emotionally. Uh, he's a World War II veteran. Uh, looks as though he served t time in the Pacific, uh, and he has t trouble readjusting uh, to civilian life. Trouble is a mild statement. Well, there. yeah, uh, uh, he seems to be fixated on sex. I mean, that's a big problem. And also he self-medicates. But also in addition to self-medication, there is a self-destructive bent to him. He makes his own alcoholic concoctions, and they may include anything from Lysol to paint thinner. 
Uh, the guy really has some problems. He stumbles across a guy uh, played by um, Philip, Philip Seymour Simon. Hoffman. Uh, who is a very charismatic individual. Uh, Anderson based him on L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. Uh, and there are some similarities here, too, because the uh, Hoffman character is the head of a movement that he calls the cause. And much of what the cause is founded on, or the foundation of it, is pretty hinky stuff. Uh, we deal with past lives. Uh, we deal with finding your one true self. Um, and really, it becomes evident early on that this guy is a charlatan. Mm. Uh, even his son says, you know, he's making all this up as he goes along. Mm. Uh, but still, the uh, Phoenix character comes under his sway and becomes it, like his right-hand man at times. Yeah, I was going to say his right-hand man, his henchman. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, but their relationship is quite rocky. I mm. mean, it has its ups and downs. Um, but it is something that covers years of a, at a time. Uh, the Phoenix character will drop out of his life at times, then reemerge. Should be noted that Amy Adams plays uh, Hoffman's wife, and she is perhaps the strongest individual in the film. I would say so, yes. Uh, as far as moral character is concerned, well, maybe not moral character, but as far as Considering seeing a goal did. and keeping her husband on that track. Yeah, I mean, that's her job. I think, uh, I think all the individuals in this film, all the leads, are very tormented in various ways. Ah. Uh, I would say not so much her. I would, but say, those a two, I would say a little bit. Those two, well, she's, she, I think she's an opportunist as well. Uh, well I think she's she, an opportunist, but I think she's also a control freak. Yeah, I think she if has it, to be. I to think she does to keep him in line and to keep both of them in line. You know, to try and describe this, uh, a story, is a little rough. As I say, it's about this two, these two guys' relationship. It's about how this movement is starting to gain some traction. But really what I thought it was, was about was is that I thought the Hoffman character was just as damaged as the Joaquin Phoenix character. I think they're both searching for something. They don't know what. These are both very fragmented, damaged men. Yeah. And while the Phoenix character is looking for some sort of truth, I think the Philip Seymour Hoffman character has just made his own truth. Yeah, I was going to say inventing it. He has invented this, this cause, this thing, this, this, this movement that becomes that gives people a purpose or some answers. And basically what I think the movement does is, is that it preys upon people who are just like him, people who are damaged, people who are fragmented, and they flock to him simply because even though what he is preaching is ludicrous, there is a void in their lives, mm -hmm. and they need to hear this. I thought that uh, the Hoffman character and the Phoenix character were two sides of the same coin. I think the Hoffman character is the ego. Mm -hmm. And the Phoenix character is the id. I would agree. There is no filter for Phoenix. I mean, if he has a sexual impulse, he acts on it. Mm -hmm. If there is a violent impulse, he acts on it. There's no thinking involved. And it's just me, 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 me. But, of course, the Hoffman character, he has that too, but he can hide that, and he's all about the ego because another big thing with him and the cause is feeding his ego. He loves that praise. He does mm -hmm. not want to be questioned. So, really, I think the movie is about damage people searching for answers. I and agree. I, and I think that one of, the big, one of the better things I liked about the film is that it concedes, I think, that sometimes there are no answers. Yeah. And sometimes, unfortunately, we are damaged, and we have to find our own way to deal with that. I don't think we can look to outside sources uh, because you'll just be taken advantage of. <clears throat> but more importantly, you're not going to find the personal answer you need mm -hmm. to solve whatever problems you have. Joaquin Phoenix, best performance I've seen this year. Yeah. Guy's incredible. What about Philip Seymour Hoffman? I oh, he's good, too, but, I mean, Phoenix, come on. Phoenix was... He just... I mean, I always thought the guy was a little wacky, but he but. mines that to such great results here because not only is he crazy, but I felt sorry for him. I felt sorry for him, too. And you I, know. I was shocked I felt sorry for him. Me, exactly, and I think that was the trick. You end up like, God, this poor guy. Yeah, you like, know. he has no way out. There's nothing that None. can save him. Um no. I want to put forth a theory. I think the entire Dodd family, by the way, the character, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's right. character's name is Lancaster, Lancaster Dodd. Lancaster Dodd, right. Uh, I think the entire Dodd family is, m is <laughs> a bit messed up. Can I, can I need to explain why I say this. Not only is Lancaster uh, Dodd searching for his own truth, his wife is basically the, the gear behind making everything in that truth work. She is the 
uh, oil that keeps her husband's motor running in more ways than one. Um, we also see uh, a side uh, pieces of the family, a daughter who got married to a husband who uh, apparently she doesn't love because she was willing to test uh, Jack, uh, Walking Phoenix's impulses. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know what her motive is in the film. Is she just wanting to cause trouble or is she tormented too and going along with her father's ride? <coughs> well, you know, whenever, we, whenever you see a family that's dysfunctional, you know, there it, have it, to be offshoots of to that dysfunctionality. Sure, I mean, the kids observe that, and, you know, it has to manifest itself in some way. Uh, you mentioned the daughter. Well, he also has a son as well, who, even though he, too, is along for the ride and obviously seems to be enjoying uh, the fruits of his father's labor, he certainly has no respect for him, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, he, he pokes holes in, in everything he does. Yeah, and I think the standout scene of the film is not when they're in jail together talking. It's not the first processing scene. It's when Dodd is confronted by the person who is a non-believer. I believe that yeah. is the strongest scene of the entire film. Yeah. Although I did like the processing scene. Oh, I thought that was I love the processing well. scene, but I still think yeah. that that other scene is stronger. You know, and that's one of the keys of the film. There are things there I'm not going to forget any time soon. As a story, it is fragmented, but I think that he does that purposely. Anderson does that purposely to reflect these characters. I know. To reflect the messiness of of life, of emotions, of psychology that's damaged. I mean, and you know, people will walk away and say, well, what, what did we just see? Well, it's a reflection of what, uh, you know, the pain and the, the, the structure of these guys' lives. Mm -hmm. Especially during that time period. Completely, yeah, when we were still working on theories on behavior and, yeah, we didn't know as much as we do today. Yeah, and even though we do know more today, I think it's still reflective of our current sure. times. Sure, it, I, I, You know, it's one of those movies, I don't know about you, but the more I think about it, the better it gets. Yeah, I mean, I originally was, when I saw The Master a few days after, I was starting to poke holes like, does that work? Does that make sense? And I, I realized after like day four of thinking about it, there's no way I'm going to solve these answers. I just have to be glad that I was able to enjoy the idea of the notion of human life being tormented to such yeah, an extent. There is no solving. Yeah. And that's the point. Yeah, That's I really enjoyed this film. I wouldn't give it five out of five stars because there are some things that I just could not get over. For instance, the level of nudity in this film was shocking. I, I mean, it was though. I mean, there's tons of it that I didn't see coming. Like the beginning bit, okay. Are uh, you saying it was gratuitous? There is one scene in which I felt that it was completely gratuitous. The scene where... Uh, they're all uh, gathered around having a party for the cause, and a lady is playing piano, and then we see things from Freddie's point of view. Now, that would be fine if he was giving a speech, and he imagined that. I'd be completely okay with that, because everybody has that notion too, okay, I'm freaked out and terrified that I'm on stage now. I'm going to picture the audience naked. If it were that, I'd be fine. But it's literally a celebration of the cause of success, and he's imagining this. I didn't see where that would fit in at all. I found it completely pointless and gratuitous. Do you have another theory that could... Yeah, I'm going to leave that one alone. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Um, so this is another four and a half out of five. Yeah, I would say... So it's, it's no Mrs. Doubtfire. <laughs> what you say? I didn't think which is which is the apex for, for you, right? But that's a comedy. Is this really a comedy though? That's well, nothing funny about it at all. Well, I think I think <coughs> that's an interesting thing I should mention here for the master before we leave it is that there are comedic funny parts in this film, but it's based on Freddie's reactions to different things. But it's not intentional. It's not funny. That's all uncomfortable. It's all uncomfortable. I mean, you may laugh, but you're laughing because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> can't believe he did that. For, for, the, <laughs> for the first time this year, I really felt like a voyeur through all, all of this entire film. And that means Anderson did his job then. And so did the actors. I agree. Yeah. I would agree completely. What would you give it? Uh, I gave it three and a half out of four. Three and a half out of I, yeah. I looked for your review and I could not find it. On it's in own. this week's paper. Oh, it's in this week's yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah, you know, old, old school. So oh. Actually, paper, paper. You're, you're going to rub that in? No, I'm just saying. Okay. Just saying. Okay. okay. What film did you see that you wanted yeah, to talk about? I want to talk about? about real quick because I think it's one of the best movies I've seen this, seen this year. Uh, End of Watch. 
A lot of people love that film. Love that movie, and you're thinking, do we need another cop movie? Talk to me about it, because Roger Ebert loved this, too. I loved it as well. Uh, actually, it was directed and written by a guy named David Ayer, who was born in Champaign. Was he? Yeah, I stumbled upon that little bit of information. Don't know how much time he spent in Champaign, because apparently most of his youth was spent in Los Angeles. Movie, uh, family moved to Los Angeles, and apparently they lived in a very rough neighborhood. So he saw a lot of you know, rough stuff there. He's the guy who wrote Training Day. Right. He also wrote uh, Dark Blue, a great Kurt Russell film that no one saw. He plays a corrupt cop who then has to wrestle with uh, his conscience. Better and than it, Rampart, I imagine. It's, yeah, yeah. It is the movie Rampart I think wanted to be. Uh, and then uh, Eric got a chance to finally direct as well as write uh, end, of, end of Watch. You know, what I liked about the film was that, you know, so many cop films are like, okay, we've got to solve this case. You know, it's one case and we get to stop. And that's not what this is. It, it takes place over months at a time. And we get a day here, and we get a day there, and we get a day here as this period of time is stretched out over the course of the film. So, right. so I like that. It was very nonlinear, although it did have a through line with it when you get into the relationships of this film. You need to see this. Your girl's in it, Anna Kendrick. Is she attractive is it, in it? Oh, she's awful. She's absolutely hideous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing about the movie is, is that they have a neat little thing where the, Jake Gyllenhaal is one of the cops. He's taking a film class, a night film class, because he's working on his college degree, and he wants to shoot footage to use in a final project. So he comes up with these little lapel-type cameras that he attaches on each of their uniforms. So that gives us an interesting visual perspective right, when they really the get into in. uh, a lot of really bad situations. But the, the, the key to this movie, here's the key. I don't know how much time Gyllenhaal and Michael Pena, who plays the, his partner, spent together off screen, but it must have been extensive because what makes this film so good is that you really, really believe that these guys love each other, that these guys are partners, that you know, when they say, you know, I'd take a bullet for you, you get the sense that they mean it. You really care for them. You really do. And that really does heighten the suspense of the film because you're thinking, oh, God, I hope they get out of this one. Oh, man, I don't want to see this guy get hurt. I don't. So it really ups that emotional investment that you have because you like them so much. Great performances mm -hmm. by them and really, really incredibly gritty. I mean, uh, they shot there. You can tell they shot out on those streets, and it just transfers beautifully to the screen. I really like this film a lot, and I hope that people see it. I hope they don't just think, oh, another cop movie. It's much more than that, and you really take your hat off to the cops, to police officers everywhere after you see it, because it's mm -hmm. like one of those where it's like, wow, that job sucks. Thanks yeah. for doing it. Yeah. I heard um, Joan Hall did a ride-along um, a few months ago. I heard he did a few of those, yeah. And mm -hmm. then um, saw people get, you know, <coughs> murdered or things of that nature, and it really changed his life, and I, I really want to see End of Watch, mostly because of that relationship between Michael Pena and Jake Joan Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be phenomenal. They are great. And I think I also heard maybe the same interview. He did, said something about training. Now. He never keeps anything now in his left hand mm -hmm. or something, some sort of training was that you keep one hand free in case something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And he, I, I guess he's carried over some of that stuff. So, you know, he's not even conscious that he's doing it now mm -hmm. in his life. Uh, and it all pays off wonderfully. Yeah. Well, the third and final movie that I saw this week uh, was something that, you know, adults won't be into it and kids won't be into that. It's that middle ground for the middle crowd. I saw The Dark Knight Returns. Um, and this is based on the Frank Miller graphic novel, mm -hmm. the same name. Uh, the plot of the film is basically that Bruce Wayne, aging 65-year-old in retirement, kind of is seeing the world go to crap. And uh, for reasons that are foreign to me, he decides, you know what, I've seen enough of these uh, criminals destroy my city. I need to get back out there. Well, he does get back out there. And at first you're thinking, oh, it's the glorious days of Batman. Batman's going to, you know, beat people up and get answers and get results. But he's older now. He's slower. He doesn't have all of the physical capability he used to. It's not that he's completely decrepit. He can still throw a mean punch, but he's weakened. Missed a step or two. Yeah. yeah. Should mention that this is straight to video and it's animated. Yeah, it is. Um, one of the other things that are, is interesting about the film 
is that you really feel for the frailty of Bruce Wayne and Batman, the duality of him knowing that he has to make the city right because Commissioner Gordon's retiring and somebody's coming in his place. Uh, also the fact that, you know, there are these new gangs <coughs> that he's basically trying to fight. I forget what they're called. Was it one based on the Joker? Is it one a Joker gang? Uh, it's supposed to be, but they have, it, it, that part hasn't shown up yet. Okay. It's coming up later. Oh, what is this, a two-part thing? It's or? a two-parter, yeah. Part one ah, was... Okay. Uh, I haven't seen it. I'm just basing it on the comic, which yeah. I've read. Part, uh, part one focuses on this kind of zombie-like gang. They have these visors, and, you know, Batman has to fight them off and has to fight this bigger guy. Is Two-Face in the first part? He is, yes. Yes, okay, good. good. Um, that's a great storyline. Y- that's a brilliant storyline. Um, I want to explain that bit, because that's the bit that I found most enjoyable. Skip him fighting the gangs. Him, uh, his relationship to Two-Face, what they do, and I believe this is correct with the comics, is that they fix Two-Face's face. Yeah, plastic mm-hmm. surgery. But... He psychologically does not see it. Right. And knowing that is so painful. Yeah. Because you see him desperately continuing to do these acts of things and twos. Yeah, his behavior, his mind is still his, scarred. His mind is still completely scarred. Yeah. And no amount of therapy is going to change that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's a really fantastic film with really fantastic visuals. Be aware for those who are 13 and younger, there is blood in the film. It is very bloody and, and violent, but the story is absolutely incredible. Have you read the one. comic? No, I have not. Okay, well, I'm not going to tell you what happens next. But uh, I know the yeah. Joker eventually gets out. Oh, he gets out, but then I'm not going to tell you what happens next. I know that uh, no one said that there are some things in the last Batman film that were inspired by this comic. I assume, there, there I, are obviously obvious correlations. There are obvious <coughs> correlations. Um, I, I'm, sh- I'm assuming they got far enough in this first part to introduce the new Robin. Yes, they did. Her name's Carrie, I think. Yes. Yeah, and she's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a girl that he <laughs> reluctantly a, takes on. Yeah, um, yeah, because he gets the crap beat out of him by the bigger guy. Right, and, and she sees him come back, I think, and, and wants to emulate him in some way. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he's like, well, you're going to do this, but you're going to do this do by my right. rules. Uh, I believe at one point she dresses up as one of the gang right. members and then that, yeah. to entice them all to go to this junkyard where he has this one final right, showdown, showdown with the big guy who hurt him before. Right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rent this this weekend. Then yeah, because, it, uh, it's a great movie. I didn't realize it was I wouldn't pick it up until the second part comes out, though. Just to watch it all continuously? I would watch it all continuously because <laughs> the person they have voicing the Joker is Michael Emerson from Lost. Oh, perfect. And uh, the person they have voicing Batman uh, at this time is somebody who I've admired for years and hope that he gets a career break, Peter Weller. Peter Weller. I think the ship sailed on Peter Weller, but okay. Uh, watch his role in Dexter uh, from last season. But then again, he is in the new Star Trek movie coming out next year. And he is so in the could be a, uh, And let's hope he has a cameo in the RoboCop remake, I which is coming out. I want that so bad. So that would be um, great. So yeah, that's all we have for this week. Uh, we'll see you next time right here on Rural Review Cinematic Underground. See you later.